right? Uh, before, before the capitalism, before the modern finance system, there was a clear distinction between the right in REM, that is a property owner's right, and right in personum, creditor right. Uh, so, cap the property owners could control their property and took a, took a full responsibility for the use of, the, of their property. By contrast, creditors transfer the ownership of their property to the creditors, and in return for the transfer, they took uh, interest but didn't take any responsibility for the, how, the creditor, how the borrower used their property. But in the shareholders, in the shareholder, in the present form of a joint, joint stock company, enjoyed the right of debtor, as well as, uh, uh, right of creditor, as, uh, as well as a right of owner while minim minimizing their responsibility as owner. First, they are, they are like creditors. They transfer legal ownership to the company. So in return for the transfer, they, tr they take interest like dividend. And they do not take any re legal responsibility for how the company used the, their invested money Money, for example, even even though the the company runs run the sweep uh, shot in the south of the country, they do not any re legal re responsibility for the this kind of uh, in unethical work. It, it is uh, at the legal responsibility belong to the manager. But also, shareholders are the owners. They are equal, equitable owner, but with little responsibility because they took only limited liability. So in this sense, they are, their right is hybrid between the property owner's right and the credit, creditor's right. But, but before the, this kind of a joint stock company, traditional collective group powers always is not well. It's not blood between the creditors' right and property owners' right. For example, family 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 enterprise in family enterprise, the member family took a full responsibility. Also in commander and society, this form of collective power is very popular in the late medieval Italian city. The investor in the in this in this companies are more like creditors because the ship left the harbor for the foreign trade. So investor cannot, couldn't control, the how, control how the, 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 the traders traded, what, what traders are doing in the foreign country because it, the ship is already left the harbor. So their right is more like a creditor, not the owner. So, so in the so in the post world decade, many critical thinkers reject principle of shareholder primers. For example, Dodd, Dodd, Berlin and Means, Veblen, Tony, Lasky, Keynes, and others. They argue that shareholders are not a traditional owner, but is a they call is a renter or a passive owner. They took only limited liability. And they argue that the sheer size and economic power of this joint, joint stock company led, led us to regard this company not as a private enterprise to be, to be run solely in the shareholders' interest, but as increasingly social and public institution. But in spite of these critics, there is no radical reform of company law regarding the director's duty and the shareholder's right. Actually, actually Keynes expect that big enterprise tended to socialize itself. In fact, the K 
exchange expect, expectations seemingly sound true, because in this, in that time, in 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 the Bretton Woods system, the power finance and the fi power shareholders has been weakened because because in in the in the Bretton Woods system, but but. Since the, since the middle of the 1970s, when the new institution, institutional finance architecture began to be shaped, uh, yeah, things, uh, things suddenly changed. The power of finance and the power of shareholders regained its strengths. So the reason what we witness right now is a finance crisis. Yeah, hybridity, hybridity of modern, fine, modern banking. Before the, before the modern banking, deposit transaction and loan transaction were clearly uh, distinguished. Uh, what, the, what difference is this to this transaction is that whether there is an exchange of a present availability of good for the future availability of good. For example, in the loan transaction, the, the creditor transfer the ownership of the property and the present availability of the good to the borrower. So borrowers will take this present availability. So creditors do not have, and no, no longer have a present availability of the good. But in Deposit transaction, when depositor tra deposit the, their money to the depository, they, have, uh, they still re retain the, the present availability because they can withdraw at any time when they need it. But in modern banking, actually it's hybrid. As first, it is a credit transaction because uh, depositor transfer ownership to the, the bankers. Banker loan deposit money to the third party. So the per a person can loan the money to the third party when, only when the person has ownership of it. So yeah, ownership and present like, uh, availability of the money transfer to the bank. But at the same time, but Practically, deposit, depositor withdraw the money at any time on demand when they need it. So present availability and ownership of the money still remain in the hand of the depositor. So it is a hybrid. So because of a hybrid, hybridity, there is, a, there, is a, there is a double ownership. So there are two, so one amount of Cash creates two current balance of the same amount. One is by the depositor, the other is a hold of the banknote. So, yeah, two sides argue that it is my own, it is my money. So, Austrian school, uh, school of economists argue that this, because of this, this double ownership scheme, there is a fund fundamental reason of a finance crisis. Yeah. If, you, if you look at the, the difference between the Bank of England and the, Amst the Bank of Amsterdam in the, in the 7th century, if you, if you look at the, the difference to bank, we can understand how, what is a hybridity means. Actually, two bankers, two, two, two banks are deposit-taking bank, but deposit-taking is the way of they deposit-taking deposit is very different. Uh, first, uh, the Bank of Amsterdam actually yeah, take a deposit, but do not make loan this deposit to the third party. So they maintain 100% cash reserve. Uh, since since they, their foundation for the one and the fifty years, so their role is a clear the creditor debt relation that occurred in between the merchant. Uh, 
So in, in Amsterdam, all merchants legally obliged to submit bill of exchange, their bill of exchange to the bank. So in the bank, the bank cleared these bill of exchange using my the deposit account that the merchant made in the bank. So you know, the, the bill of exchange is a credit, credit instrument. It's not a money. It's a, it, is a, it, it is play as a means of exchange, but it's a credit. So it is a, because it is credit, it is a credit to relation. So bill, the bank role is to clear the creditor-debt relation. But in the case of Bank of Bank England, they maintain only fraction reserve and uh, make loan this deposit to the third party. So make, by combining deposit taking and loan making, they make a mutual indebtedness between the bank and the, the borrower. So bank become the debtor because of the, the paper money they issue to the third party is a promise, banker's promise to pay is a bank's debt. But when they issued the banknote, actually they loaned the banknote to the third party. So the holdover banknote became the debtor. So they became the two party simultaneously became the debtor. So the Bank of, Bank of England, Bank of England is a modern banking. The modern banking actually extends creditor debt relation rather than clear the creditor debt relation. Yeah, hybridity of the financial scheme, such as mutual fund. Actually, it's open endedness. Open ended is a finance term, a financial jargon. It means that uh, you can redeem. If you invest your money to the mutual fund, you can redeem the money when, when you need it at any, any time. But you, the, usually there is a restriction. So for, for example, you need to yeah, wait for yeah, six months or one year. But after six months or one year, you can redeem this money when you need it. So after six months or one, one year, the, you can use the money you, you, when you need it. So this money constitutes your current balance. So it is your money. But because you put the money into the fund, the mutual fund, or also the mutual fund loan this money to the third party. So it's already third party's property. So in this sense, there is a true exclusive owner exists for the, on the same amount of money. So in this, in, because of a double ownership, it kind of, it, it is kind of credit, like creation of money. So eventually it, it yeah, contributes to the finance crisis. So what I suggest for the general reform principle to, is for the, to prevent the future financial crisis is to abolish this hybridity. First, in the, in the case of corporation, the manager and worker be, will become the owner and the investor became the creditor. In, 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 the, bank, in, the, modern, in the case of bank, the bank's role is just clearing credit debt relation and the deposit taking for the safe keeping, safe keeping and maintain a 100 cash reserve ratio. And in the case of mutual fund, there, yeah, we, we can abolish the, no, the open endedness. So we can, the mutual fund cannot no longer create money. So cannot create, yeah, cannot contribute to the finance crisis. So, in consequently, I argue that this principle stopped the misuse of collective power. Yeah, thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I was originally going to discuss uh, 
money and its relationship to structures of exchange as described in anthropology, but I had just written a review of Capitalist Power, which will be out, uh, I'm told, in the spring, and uh, I was told to make some comments about that. So um, here's what I'm trying to do uh, with that, and I'll try to be fast. Uh, my purposes are different from those, as I understand them, um, in Capitalist Power. Uh, one, I want to clarify the meaning of capitalist power in the context of a general theory of society. This is not something that Nitzan and Bickler are trying to do. Um, uh, specifically, I have in mind Lumen and Parsons and, and that tradition. Uh, and to suggest reformulation and specification of, of some of its main concepts, including power, capital, capitalism, capitalization. Basically, just to talk about what it means, uh, how to define them. Uh, two, to relate the capitalist power concept of power to the existing sociological literature on power, which hasn't yet been done. So I just want to discuss the different definitions and which ones are most applicable. And three, to begin to think about power or money. I'm not going to discuss three so much. It's, it's actually, it overlaps with a lot of what's already been said. Okay. Okay. Um, number one, ontological monism. Okay, so Nitzan and Bickler not only argue that states serve the interests of capital, they're advancing the much more radical thesis that states and corporations cannot and should not be distinguished in the first place. Now, that's how I interpret this, um, and here's a quote to back that up. My argument is, is that you have to be able to um, conceptually uh, distinguish the two, uh, state and capital or states and markets. In order to measure their degree of integration, they have to be uh, possibly uh, separate or distinct. Um, more abstractly, you can say that to observe means to draw a distinction or the meaning of a concept depends on the distinction used to indicate it. In order for something, in order to see something, uh, you have to distinguish between foreground and background uh, and so on. Um, I like to use gestalt images and I like this quote from Guy E. Swanson, thinking without comparison is unthinkable. Uh, the references are here. Uh, G. Spencer Brown's Calculus of Indications, which was picked up later by Niklas Luhmann in his theory of self-referential systems. Um, so essentially, concepts have opposites, to, you know, to put it simply. To define a concept requires a, an explicit comparison or distinction. So I'm just asking the question, what are we comparing it to? I have two questions, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so for example, if you have a concept of north as south, then you have to specify what it is you are comparing north as south to. And I think that that would be a suggestion that could be made to further this research program. Uh, if you have north to south, um, then you could compare it to east and west. But then if you had uh, north and south, if you conflated the distinction of latitude and longitude, then you'd be in a lot of, a lot of trouble. OK, so my first question regarding this is, from what is the capitalist mode of power distinguished? Um, the concept of capitalist power is distinct from and implicitly compared to the concept of a feudal mode of power, at least in one point, uh, which is fine. Uh, but this comparison is not useful for making other types of comparisons or detecting variation uh, within the capitalist mode of power itself. Um, so you would need to draw different distinctions, more fine-grained distinctions, um, or at least not with respect to studying the extent of government and corporate integration. Two, from what is the state of capital uh, distinguished. Um, so when they say that they are no longer separate, that may be empirically true, but in order to measure that, you have to draw the conceptual distinction. So if they are integrated, it means that they are at least possibly or conceptually distinct. Um, so this is essentially, I'm drawing this from Parsons and, and others. Uh, essentially, you have a conceptual s set of categories, and then you fit your empirical categories with it, within those. Um, so, um, a potential problem um, is that uh, if you make this argument, at least as, as, as it's the way that it's expressed, is that you could confuse a conceptual distinction with an empirical distinction. Um, so the historically unique interdependence of private and state power does not erase the conceptual uh, distinction between them. And um, another way of saying that is that you need to distinguish institutional uh, historical actualizations from system functions. Um, 
And there's a list of possible distinctions that could be made, private, public, markets, states, economy, polity, and so on. So it's at least uh, possible to distinguish markets and states, for example, according to the type of power that they wield. Now, this is uh, an oversimplification, um, and it's a conceptual rather than a concrete distinction. Um, but it's one that's nevertheless useful. Markets can be described as using induced power. That's uh, from Dennis's wrong, uh, Wrong's book called Power. Uh, and states may be regarded as using coercive power. There's a whole literature on that. Um, so to summarize, without conceptually uh, distinguishing states and markets, empirical uh, measurement of their degree of integration uh, becomes impossible. Uh, so to, to suggest that state and corporate power have fused is to presuppose that they are conceptually different and hence possibly distinct. Um, it presupposes, to, uh, it means to say that they, at one time they were not, or at least they may not, uh, it's possible for them to not be uh, integrated. Um, to make the argument that they are integrated presupposes their conceptual distinction, so we need to elaborate uh, precisely what that conceptual distinction is. I mean, it's, it's not incompatible at all with the book. It's just a suggestion. Um, uh, so, for example, um, there's a lot of great empirical work uh, in this book, and I've learned a lot from it. Um, however, sometimes the empirical work doesn't substantiate the claims that are made. So, for example, um, the dominant capital is operationalized as 100 most profitable firms, and there's a lot of great information provided there. It's not problematic in itself. However, one cannot infer from this finding anything about the integration of capital and state power. I'm not exactly sure how you measure the integration of capital and state power. It's pretty difficult because the data are not readily available. Um, skipping ahead. One possible suggestion, which I think is pretty cool, is the triple helix model um, using non-parametric statistics. Um, basically, information theory, you take, rather than a correlation, you take three different things and see how those three different things overlap. So that might be one possible thing you can do. You might want to look into that in order to further the research program. Section two, what is price? Price is an expression of power. Uh, one, firms exercise monopoly power to set prices, and two, the distribution of income between profits and wages is an outcome of power relations. I don't think either of those arguments will generate a lot of um, controversy or objection for most political uh, economists. Uh, Nitzan and Bickler criticized Marxian and neoclassical economics alike for merely interpreting prices as nominal expressions, reflecting or distorting some objective physical magnitude rooted, rooted in the reality of material production. However, I think we need to be clear that there's a potential ambiguity in this argument. We need to distinguish capitalized goods from what I'll call consumer goods, and it's there, it's just not explicitly made. Uh, capitalized goods like uh, equities, like stocks and bonds, are priced according to their expected future values, whereas non-capitalized goods or consumer goods are set by dominant firms with, with monopoly power, uh, uh, which begin with a long-term target rate of profit and then back calculate the market necessary to realize this rate of return over the long haul. Uh, so, in short, the price of a consumer good is whatever sellers want it to be, whereas the price of a capitalized asset is, for example, the weighted average of whatever speculators expect it to be. The implication of that, however, is that a theory of asset prices is not a general theory of price determination. Different commodities may uh, have their prices determined in various ways, so we need to be cognizant, cognizant of that. Uh, two, prices therefore reflect power in at least two different ways, uh, neither of which is consonant with the confidence and obedience um, frame or definition, which I'll describe next. And three, capitalist power approach I think might be susceptible um, to the same criticisms made against Marxian value theory, specifically the temporal single system interpretation of Kleiman. Um, in this sense, uh, it can only account for prices ex post by interpreting prices as quantitative social power in the same way that the TSSI uh, interprets um, prices as quantitative of value after the fact. So what is power? I think we need to define what power is. And I, didn't, I haven't heard anyone... Uh, define power today, so I'm just going to give you a bunch of definitions of power and then give you my favorite. Uh, so the one here is that uh, power expresses the certainty of the rulers and the submissiveness of the ruled. Um, I like this phrase, confidence and obedience. Um, it's very, it's, it's poetic. Um, and, and here's some different, um, uh, below are some different explanations of that. 
However, there's, a, there's again a disjunction between the, the data and the qualitative description of that data. So, um, number one, um, to say that power, the power of capital is, uh, is competence in obedience, um, I think misconstrues our ordinary understanding of what um, uh, uh, obedience is. So, capital neither commands nor obeys in itself. Obedience implies a command, injunction, or order to obey. So to command and to obey are transitive verbs, which means that uh, they are orders given directly from spe some specific persons to some specific others. Societies in the sense of Marxian collective self-domination, alienation, social conditions are the unintended consequences of uh, individual intended actions. We are influenced or subjected to these types of social systems, but we are not, we don't receive orders from, from them directly. Um, so a suggestion would be to use Russell's definition, which is later re refined by people like Wrong. Um, it's a simple definition. Power means the ability to produce intended effects. It's intentional influence as opposed to unintentional influence. It's organized as opposed to self-organized. And we can subdivide this into two dimensions, power to achieve goals, power over others. Two, um, is the concentration we observe caused by intended or unintended influence? That would be the big question. Now, the, uh, the main thing that isn't addressed uh, uh, is um, that the power law distributions that we observe, um, uh, which characterize the distribution of wealth, income, and even natural objects like uh, river, uh, rivers and tributaries, um, can actually, it's possible for them to result from the rules of the game, so to speak. They can be self-organized. There can be policies in place. Um, they can be unintended consequences of individual actions or um, get in structuration and so on. So uh, one suggestion would be to, agent, to use agent-based models and simulations. What you would do is, is that you would use an actual simulation um, and then observe how much inequality arises from the simulation. Uh, the simu um, an agent-based model is, uh, they're also called artificial societies, they're also called um, computational approaches, and what you do is you program certain rules, and then individual agents interact with one another, and then you see the pattern that arises. So you would want to compare the, the, what actually has happened with some simulation, because you would never actually expect to uh, explain all the R squared. You would want to, you know, by nature, some things are just stochastic and, and not really... Totally, how much time now got? Okay, so here's some power concepts. We can go through that. Yeah, 10, minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Um, uh, power is the capacity to, in, uh, in, uh, to intentionally influence others. Bertrand Russell, uh, and then Max Weber, and then Wrong, some others. Um, there's lots of different definitions of power, and I think it, uh, it would help bridge the, the divide between uh, economists and sociologists um, if these relationships were made more explicit because there's a whole body of literature out there that really isn't bridged. And I realize you can't do that in, you know, one book. You have to be several, maybe a volume. Uh, here's one map of power. Um, there's influence. There's intended influence, which is defined as power, and there's various other possible ways of categorizing power. Uh, but we want to be clear on what we mean uh, by power. Okay, uh, part two. Um, so part of my research right now is uh, actually developing a, uh, an agent-based model of um, uh, status hierarchies and showing the relationship between that and uh, uh, debt. Um, but I didn't bring that here today, so I'm going to talk about money. Um, so... Uh, we can talk about money as credit, that is a means of mobilizing human and natural resources. Credit denotes one end of a credit debit uh, debt relationship and thus expresses and exercises the power to mobilize resources by virtue of its command over the obliged. The monetary relation of credit and obligation is the prevailing form of power in capitalism today, supplanting but not entirely replacing relationships of command and, and obedience. And by command and obedience, what you have in mind here is Stanley Milgram's uh, famous study, Obedience, or the concept of airshaft. Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, command, uh, think of the military giving orders. Um, we do see the patterns, but it's clearly not a result of, you know, people giving orders. Um, so, uh, as talked about by um, 
uh, several presenters, Randall, Randall Ray, uh, who uh, uh, I was, I've been reading others. Um, um, money can be defined as social relationships, um, so you can just think of it as an obligation um, or as the object used to symbolize a social relationship. This is uh, the relationship or the thing used to symbolize uh, the relationship, and so the latter is necessarily subordinate to the former. What's more important is the unit of account uh, and so on that was discussed earlier. Uh, you can think of money as credit. Credit is the end of a debit-credit relationship, uh, which is a form of power. Uh, we're talking about uh, codified monetary obligations, which, are, which distinguish some, cert some obligations from others. So we have quantified uh, obligations, quantified in various ways. Um, and a debt is specifically a, um, a legal obligation as opposed to, say, uh, a liability, um, which there isn't a legal, there's no legal obligation to pay a liability, but there is for a debt. So we've already infused, we already see a connection here between the state on the one hand and, uh, and the economy on the other. Um, so let's go through some of this. Um, stated, uh, I'm just going to rephrase and state a little differently what some of the arguments that have come before. Um, so we can regard credit as a political power relationship, and this isn't new in the sociological literature. Um, Parsons and uh, Smelser talked about the creation of credit as primarily an exercise of power. Um, and not uh, an economic uh, form of influence. And so they regarded credit as specifically a form of, um, uh, as being in the domain of politics or the polity. Now, money is a credit. That's fine. We can understand that. But then, uh, specifically, who is the creditor and who is the debtor? Uh, so Keynes, Irving Fisher, um, a lot of other people distinguished uh, public or state money from private or bank money. Um, we can regard public money as credit issued by a state and collected as taxes. You can think of the taxpayers as the debtors, whereas private bank money is uh, uh, credit issued by private banks. Now today, these have become indistinguishable. They've been fused, as people like Ingham and a lot of others have, have stated. Um, most or all state-authorized currencies uh, issued by private banks uh, is uh, private money. So my argument here, and this is a sort of, I, I was going to ask a question, but I, I didn't get called. Um, that is regarding the the political implications of of this idea. So what policies would be implemented if, if this were true, which it is. Um, so the difference between them, between public money on the one hand and private money on the other, depends on the structures of exchange which are induced. Um, it depends on the specific tax policies, for example, that are, that are implemented. In anthropology, we talk about uh, bilateral dyadic exchange structures as opposed to generalized indirect exchange structures. The latter, generalized exchange structures, looks something, look like that. Um, and net, this is called net generalized exchange as, a, as opposed to um, generalized exchange. Um, generalized exchange would be like a circle paying it forward, A pays B, B pays C, C pays A. Net generalized exchange looks a little different. It looks like this, where A collective is, B and C collectively owe A. A gives money to uh, B and C, uh, or B or C, and then A uses up his credit, and then the money goes to C, um, and then C's got some money, so A and B are indebted to C. People like... Uh, Nobel laureate in chemistry, Frederick Soddy, uh, had this concept of money. Um, and really what you have in mind here is a sort of uh, equilibrium where the money is passing from one person to another. But in fact, that's not actually what we, what we see. That would be great if money were that. Uh, but that's distinguishing money from material wealth. That makes money not dependent on the expected value of assets, which it is today. This is basically an ideal model of state money or public money, and it pertains to a specific um, anthropologically specified structure of exchange. So uh, specifically in the U.S., uh, the Federal Reserve prints Federal Reserve notes, which function as legal tender or fiat currency. It's different uh, from country to country. Um, but in the U.S., uh, and everywhere it's mostly private bank money. Uh, but specifically in the U.S., it's interesting that... Uh, I was going to go into this. One minute? Okay. Um, let me just, uh, this is 
Let me give you uh, some, some data on who holds U.S. Treasury securities. Um, specifically regarding public debt. Public debt shouldn't matter. Um, for one, we're mostly indebted. Uh, most of the debt is domestically owned, which means you can tax people to get the money. Okay? Uh, second of all, um, there's no reason why the Treasury should be borrowing from the Federal Reserve anyway. Um, and uh, one question that it had was regarding the policy set forth by Dennis Kucinich, which is based on um, narrow banking or 100 percent reserves, would have, have effectively nationalized the Treasury in the United States, or nationalized the Federal Reserve, sorry, in, in the United States, integrating it with the Treasury. But then in addition to that, it would have outlawed uh, fractional reserve banking, which means that the state would have the power to spend money directly into existence rather than having money or credit or power being uh, loaned um, bilaterally by private, pri private bank interests. Um, so if you see the holders of U.S. Treasury securities here, um, by 2010, um, the foreign composition, foreign meaning this is for the United States, um, goes up. But look at the Federal Reserve has about 11 percent of that, which is, which is crazy. So the Federal Reserve is like creating the money, which the Treasury then borrows. So right now, the Treasury, uh, whatever it doesn't collect in taxes, has to borrow. But that's just a legal convention. They, the Treasury could just spend the money, could create the money itself. There's no reason why that, that's not possible. So this whole, this whole crisis is fabricated, um, but nevertheless real. Okay, uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to invite uh, questions and comments from the floor at this point. Yes, I, I don't like usually to jump first, but uh, this is begging, really. Um, uh, I think that I have the advantage of actually having read uh, your reviews, where I think the other people in the audience haven't. Uh, so it, it's important that uh, I give my take of it. Initially, I thought that uh, I will correspond with you and maybe... Uh, well, both of us, Shimshon and myself, and maybe have an exchange, but very quickly re we realized that we're not going to have it. And the reason is that uh, your reading of our book um, is uh, at best a collection of misunderstandings. Uh, and at, work, at worst, I think, that you're reading in a book whatever you want to read rather than what we write. And I'd like to give a few examples. For instance, uh, you conflate back and forth the concept of the market, the corporation, and capital, and you exchange between them. You do similarly with state and government. Uh, we make a very clear uh, claim that under the capitalist mode of power, um, the state of capital encompasses within it both uh, governmental and corporate entities. Uh, we are not saying that, say, the state and the corporation is the same thing. Uh, but you liberally attribute to us all sorts of claims that we actually never make. A second example, you argue that um, there is a difference between capitalized prices and consumer prices, that consumer prices are not capitalized. Well, of course they are capitalized. Any product on the market can be sold this period, the next period, the period after. So if it's sold this period, it's discounted for uh, one period with a rate of discount of one. If it's sold next period, it will incorporate in it the discount rate, the risk that is not going to be sold, etc. You argue, for example, that uh, market prices have uh, no uh, uh, embodiment of power. They're not reflecting power because they're not set by corporations. So what? I mean, you look at the price of oil, which is ostensibly set by the market, or the price of grain. We are going to see uh, Joe speaking about grain prices. Uh, and certainly, they involve institutions of power that can be clearly articulated. Again, you're attributing to us claims that we never make. Thirdly, uh, you argue that uh, our claim uh, about prices can be uh, likened to the claim of Marxist that uh, Prices can be understood only ex post. Well, that's exactly what we are saying. But that is not what the Marxists are saying. The Marxists are saying that prices, the quantities in the nominal world, are a reflection of 
uh, real and objective quantities in the material world, and they never deliver. We never make this claim in the first place. Now, finally, I want to say, and it will take about a few minutes to, to articulate that, you give a very long list of all sorts of uh, power definitions, uh, and you just basically pick and choose the one you like the most, and that should be satisfactory in your opinion. Now, I'd like to say something about the history of power that perhaps very few people are aware of. In fact, the concept of force and the concept of power, especially how we understand them in cosmology, uh, have a very long history. Uh, there are, in fact, three major periods. Uh, the first pre-scientific or semi-scientific period up until the year 1600 uh, is marked by two properties. First, force is considered to be an entity in its own right. So if you take an object or if you take a property such as heat, then you can put next to them the entity called force. So force is an entity in its own right. Secondly, force is treated qualitatively. Nobody has ever tried until the year 1600 to uh, quantify force. So that's the first period, the pre-scientific period, the um, uh, uh, semi-scientific period. The scientific period of mechanical um, understanding of the cosmos begins with Kepler, really. And Kepler is the first one to say force is not an entity in its own right. It's a relationship between entities. And secondly, he's the first one to come and say force is a quantitative thing. We can understand it quantitatively, and that's what we should do, and he actually does it. Newton comes next, and Newton basically said Force is the glue that actually makes the reality possible. It's the thing that connects everything together. And the last stage of this mechanical picture is the theories of dynamism that uh, come with Ernest Mach, with Kirchhoff, and with her, uh, sorry, with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that come with uh, Leibniz, with Kant, and with Boscovich that argue that actually force is not the glue that uh, connects things in reality. Force is the very elementary particle that makes reality possible in the first place. And I think that our understanding uh, is very close to the ideas of Boscovich on that remark. Now, finally, we have the last stage in the treatment of force that comes with people such as Ernest Mach, uh, Kirchhoff, and Hertz, in which uh, physics moves away from force because force is understood as uh, a metaphysical entity that has nothing to do with physics. So n nowadays, in theoretical physics, force actually is expunged from, from theoretical physics. It doesn't exist as an entity. It's a heuristical device. It's a mathematical device, but it doesn't have any existence. Now, in my opinion, uh, most of the theories of force in the social sciences, yourself included, belong to the pre-scientific or semi-scientific stage in which force is an entity. It's like a battery. Uh, it, this, is, this is Bernard Russell's notion that basically you have force and then you allocate it as if you have some sort of a charge. And it's not quantifiable. So because a mother has uh, ultimate power over a child, she has probably more force than the U.S. government that does not have ultimate power uh, over its subjects. Uh, and it cannot be comparable because it's not quantifiable. This is the state in which most... Uh, social theories deal with power. We are moving, I think, to the edge of the mechanical uh, worldview in which power is actually what makes reality in the first place. So I think that there is a huge divide between the critique that you offer of power and your own concept of power that has absolutely no universal principle to compare different powers. Uh, I know that this is pretty forceful, but I think that uh, uh, the arguments that uh, you suggested uh, as a critique of our book are so wrong-headed that I had to uh, clarify, at least for the audience. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Jonathan. If we could have Randall next, Professor Randall Ray. Okay, um, two comments. First, on um, the uh, foreign-held um, U.S. Treasuries, because that came up twice today. Actually, if you look over time and if you plot foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries and the U.S. current account deficit, they match. <laughs> and the reason is because we pay for imports uh, by um, issuing dollars that are held by foreign, uh, mostly central banks, which are reserves at the Fed, and they say, hey, rather than earning zero, we would like to earn a positive return, 
and therefore they buy treasuries. So that's how they get there. Um, we, of course, we never borrow from Chinese. That would be crazy uh, because we are the issuers of uh, the dollar. We, we actually can't even borrow dollars from Chinese. We create the dollars that the Chinese hold and then we let them earn interest by moving from what's essentially a checking account at the Fed, we call it reserves, to a savings account at the Fed, we call it U.S. Treasuries. Um, it, it doesn't give the Chinese any power over us whatsoever, except to the extent that our policymakers don't understand this. <laughs> and they don't. And they don't. Um, this, the, and then the other comment is on um, the Austrian view of banks. It, it's just completely confused. <laughs> um, as Minsky always said, banks don't lend. Money lenders lend. If you, if you want to borrow uh, money from a lender, you go to a street corner in Chicago and there are money lenders there and they lend. Okay, They actually will give you cash. What banks do is they accept. They don't lend, they accept. They accept your IOU and then they issue their own IOU. They never lend money. You can never go to a bank with a wheelbarrow and say, hey, I would like to borrow $100,000. They don't do that. What they do is they credit your bank account. That's all. They substitute their IOU for your IOU. They accept yours and they issue their own. And so the, all the Austrian proposal, well, their explanation of the crisis is slightly on the right track, but their reforms are all completely wrong because they don't understand what banking is all about. They're not lenders. Okay, do we have any more questions or comments out there? You want to make an answer? Um, no, I think we'll just answer those questions then. John, I'll go first. Uh, thank you for those comments. I wish we uh, could have had this exchange earlier via email. I remember I, um, I sent you a, a draft uh, uh, when the, the paper was in its infancy. Um, I'll just say a couple things. Um, regarding power, I was talking about your definition of confidence and obedience. Um, obedience is an old concept um, which has a history and it's related to uh, people assume that there's a meaning behind that. I'm not saying that you're wrong, I'm saying that there's, a, there's better ways to describe the data that you're, you're using. I think that's a poetic moment in, in your writing which has its own value. I'm saying that we can describe that differently. Um, regarding, I, let me say also that I think our purposes are orthogonal. I think we're across purposes um, and that's okay. I think that's fine. As I said, I'm interested in uh, talking about your theory, uh, contextualizing power, which is not what I understand uh, was the purpose of capital uh, as power, contextualizing it um, in terms of a general theory of society. Um, and Regarding the TSSI uh, and Marx, um, my argument was that to the extent that your argument uh, was uh, to the extent that you were saying that TSSI um, or value theory in general wasn't able to let me let me put it this way yeah I get it that the the, the values determined by the expenditure of socially necessary labor time and in the past is according to this model is producing um, it's like determining values and sort of a linear, it's going from the past to the present. It's not based on expectations, it's not ex post. Um, uh, and that your model differs from that. Um, what I understood, your, one of the criticisms of the TSSI was that the TSSI actually, by definition, um, equates, this is one of Marx's three equalities. Uh, don't ask me the other two, I can't remember right now, but uh, where total money equals total, what is it, value? Total money equals total value. So if you get, uh, so in the TSSI, it's basically you get lots of different prices, but the distribution itself is not actually predicted or determined. It's, that is ex post. And to the extent that you were saying that that was insufficient, that would also apply to the capital to power approach. But then at that point, you just get two theories that are, uh, consistent and then you'd have to evaluate those theories on other grounds. Um, 
that's all I was. But that's that's not even that uh, important of an argument. Regarding the the rest, um, uh, I'll just uh, leave it up to maybe we can continue this later. But thank you, John Trull. Do you have any comments regarding uh, Randall Ray's? Uh, uh, frankly, I, I don't understand what what does it mean by a bank cannot loan, do not loan, make loan to the third party. Yeah. Let me try to explain. Um, in the even in the picture where you have the. Um, uh, depositors of the banks um, deposit money, the banks lend it out, and then the depositors want to get it back. It's not the way banks work. The way that a bank works is you go in, you have a, a project, you want to buy a car, you want to buy a house, whatever it is, the bank accepts your IOU and it creates an IOU. And that IOU we call a deposit. So this vision that people bring in wheelbarrows full of cash and fill the banks full of cash and then they lend it out is just, it has, well, it, it's definitely not a description of the way banks operate now. I think it's also fiction. I don't think they operated that way in the past. But anyway, they don't operate that way now. Okay? So they issue an IOU. Now, they're called a demand deposit because on demand, whoever ends up with that demand deposit is able to demand redemption. They can uh, make a withdrawal of cash. Banks don't need any reserves whatsoever to meet that withdrawal. And in fact, in Canada, they don't have reserves anymore. There is no reserve requirement. But on demand, the uh, Bank of Canada stands ready to supply banks with reserves as they need them to meet withdrawals. So 0% reserve requirement system operates perfectly well. Any one of you can go get cash out of your ATM machine, and the Bank of Canada will ship the cash to the banks to meet any withdrawals. Now, that doesn't mean I'm opposed to the proposal of creating new kinds of banks, um, like postal savings banks, that um, don't uh, make loans in the... Um, correct sense of the term, that is, accept liabilities, um, that hold only, let's say, treasuries, and issue only insured deposits. Okay, that could be a reasonable proposal. Would it have prevented the crisis? No, not at all, because you have financial institutions all over the map that are issuing highly liquid liabilities, including the money market mutual funds, that the issuers like to pretend are as good as cash, and they were until there was a run on them. Uh, so creating a system of 100% banks is not going to prevent other financial institutions from issuing liabilities that in good times are as good as cash. Um, and when you know the crap hits the fan, the government bails them out, and therefore, everyone says, oh, well, actually, they are as good as cash. So we, we, we had a run on money market mutual funds in the past crisis. That's $3 trillion. Total insured deposits in the U.S. is only $6 trillion. So half the size of insured deposits with no guarantee at all, although the Treasury bailed them out. Frank Dodd actually, Dodd-Frank makes it illegal for the Treasury to bail them out the next time. Um, but there's still $3 trillion there. And, and they hold mostly European bank debt as their assets. So the run probably will start there. Do we have any other comments or questions? Uh, yes, I, ha I have a question uh, to Stefano. I'm, I'm not sure that we got the gist of your uh, the gist of your uh, presentation, but if I did get it, uh, I'd like to understand something. You you argue that um, your discussion about Ramsey's uh, preference structure and uh, social welfare uh, makes assumptions. Uh, it makes an assumption that the object that we are trying to maximize is somehow measurable, utility, that uh, this object can actually be aggregated, 
across society in some fashion or c comparable across society in some fashion. And it also makes the assumption that it's relevant in the first place in a society in which I would argue preferences are to a large extent uh, superimposed on most people. So I'm just wondering what is the relevance of this entire discussion in general for our world and how is it related in any way to the discussion of power that we have here? Stefano, if you'd like to respond. Well, maybe it is not related at all, but um, uh, my point was uh, this is a body of um, what is called mainstream economics. And um, as you said, uh, there are very strong presuppositions like measurability, like um, making comparisons, um, and also preferences. Um, um, the, a, a good question would be, where does power come in in, in this um, um, Ramsin um, argument? Um, what I was interested in, is, in was um, the fact that, um, first of all, um, Ramses has to make normative assumptions. Um, which um, show that um, um, there is a tension um, between um, this betterness relation, which is undoubtedly um, um, a foundation of, of Ramsey's uh, discourse, um, and uh, the problem of representing uh, this betterness relation in terms of um, expected utility functions. Um, and secondly, um, um, in, in, in the paper about uh, probabilities, um, Ramses shows um, solutions of this problem, uh, uh, bridging the gap between um, ethical arguments and, um, um, and, and economical considerations, also using uh, mathematical devices. <coughs> Um, which show that um, he is using um, um, what um, Rohit Parikh, a, a computer scientist, calls um, algorithmic uh, devices uh, or um, um, uh, um, social um, social programs. <clears throat> and um, well, as to, as to power. Um, if one asks where does power uh, um, uh, shows up in um, in economic analysis, um, so <clears throat> it is either um, captured as um, as an index problem, something which comes from the outside. Um, or as some category of, of goods, uh, like uh, positional goods, um, so something which has to be axiomatized as, and has to be introduced in, in, in the system. So <clears throat> um, that's why it was very interesting for me to, um, to, to see um, and um, <clears throat> Maybe Ramsey eliminability is also known, um, uh, so you can eliminate utility from uh, from social sciences, from from uh, economics, um, but you cannot fully eliminate uh, physical entities from uh, from physical theories. Um, so either we produce um, uh, economics. Um, which performs more economics, um, or we um, um, we try to operate with the given categories, and um, 
um, we display the same kind of uh, inventiveness and, and theoretical fantasy which uh, um, um, Ramsey um, shows in, in this paper and also in his other contributions. There are two contributions um, on economics. So, um, I think uh, um, power is not in Ramsey's paper, um, but Ramsey shows how to bring in power, and not in the fashion which has been suggested by uh, other um, um, scientists who tried to to reconstruct and to interpret uh, Ramsey's model. Okay, thank you, Stefano. Any other questions? We've only got a few minutes left, so I'll ask you to keep it brief if there are any. Okay. Um, I think Joe had an announcement to make. Yeah. Thank you, uh, guys. Um, Thanks for being here today. Um, I've made a reservation uh, at a French bistro at 8.30. Um, it's uh, located downtown. Uh, the resume reservation was made for 20 people. There's around 20 people here, so if you want to come down with us, you're welcome. 